Hey everybody and welcome back to my Zero Carb Life. I am here today with Nisha Berry and this is one of these folks where when I see her on my screen right now about to talk to me, that feels crazy because I have watched her do fashion type blogging. I've watched her do nutrition blogging. I've read about her or I've seen her on Dr. Berry's videos showing up as a registered nurse. I've seen her journey into becoming a new mom. I have I've watched a lot of your stuff, Nisha, and I am so excited. I've watched you sing a lot. Oh my gosh, I love your singing videos. You are so inspiring to me, and the fact that you are here to talk to me right now is I, I feel like fangirled. Oh, that's crazy. Thank you so much. That's really good to hear that, you know, somebody likes my stuff. Dr. Barry's the big one. I'm just the, I'm the sidekick. I'm the Robin to the Batman. <laughs> So crazy. I love both of you very much. Dr. Barry Thank has you. been on the show before. I enjoy so much of what he does. But when he posts, I'm always just secretly hoping you show up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks a lot. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. So I just recently read an article that you wrote about your struggles and how you have come to through keto and towards very carnivore based keto and at times even pure carnivore how you came here, and I would just love to sit back and hear it from you. Tell us your story. Yeah, well, it's been a long journey for sure because, um, so I have Hashimoto's, and I didn't realize that in the beginning, but I had a lot of really, really bad symptoms that I just threw to the side and a lot of doctors said it was normal, it was just life and being a woman and being in are in school because I was doing the bridge program. I was an LPN. I went to the RN program. So I was stressed. And so I just listened and thought, well, yeah, it's, you know, a phase I'm going through or whatever. But turns out it wasn't. I did a lot of research online looking for other people who had the symptoms I was having and uh, started finding there was a lot of women that were right at 30 or even in their late 20s, like I was at the time, having the, I don't even know how to put into words how tired I was, but it was clearly not normal for someone 28, supposedly healthy, to be unable to get up and do the things that I used to do. So my husband, Dr. Berry, we were kind of in a new relationship at the time. And uh, so he was unaware that these were new symptoms or new personality traits or whatever, but I was. And so eventually we talked about it and did my labs. And although my thyroid labs were all normal, um, my antibodies were towards the higher end of normal. And so my mom has Hashimoto's. So we made the diagnosis of Hashimoto's, but it wasn't official because I didn't technically have it because my antibodies were normal and my TSH was normal and my free T3 and T4 and all of that stuff was within normal ranges, but they were all on the high end. So for me, even though my labs were normal, I still showed significant, serious Hashimoto syndromes, symptoms, and they were interfering with my daily life and my relationship and also fertility. So eventually we went to a fertility specialist and um, tried IUI and yeah, we did the whole try for a year thing and didn't get pregnant. Went to a fertility specialist. He confirmed my Hashimoto's diagnosis and he, the antibodies were still not super high, but they were just a little elevated. So he said, it's probably Hashimoto's. That's probably what's interfering with fertility. And apparently thyroid problems interfere with fertility frequently. And I had never heard that. So I'd heard PCOS interfered with fertility, but I didn't have PCOS at the time. And I still don't as far as I know, but my fertility specialist basically gave me an unspecified infertility diagnosis, which a lot of women get, but he thinks my thyroid was the problem. And so I was on a low dose of a desiccated thyroid. I think at the time it was nature and I've since changed over to armor because it's harder to get nature at this point. And we tried for another year changing with me on a thyroid medication. And then eventually even though I'm very stubborn and I don't like to do what I'm told, I did give keto a chance because Ken had been preaching all this keto stuff. And so I gave it a chance and saw benefits within a week of going low carb. And I wasn't even truly keto. I was doing lazy, dirty keto, you know, all that kind of stuff. 
the longer I did it, the cleaner I did it, and the better I felt. I still didn't get pregnant, even though I did keto. And you know, we hear about all these keto babies, and that didn't happen for me. So I found a fertility specialist out of New York. His name is Dr. Kiltz, and he promotes carnivore for fertility. Oh. And uh, he calls it the baby diet, and it's a uh, B-E-B-B-I, so bacon, eggs, beef, butter, and then he does a fat-based ice cream. <laughs> and that, that's, I mean, that's as carnivore as it gets, pretty <laughs> much. And the ice cream, you can either put sweetener in it or you don't have to. I didn't because I, it tasted sweet at the time to me because I was doing carnivore. And as you know, and anybody who's listening knows, once you go carnivore, things that never tasted sweet before start to taste sweet. Yep. So I didn't even need to add sweetener to the ice cream. So I did that for three months prior to my first and only cycle of IVF. We got one egg, only one, which is a little bit low, but... They always say it only takes one, and it did only take one. I only had to have one round of IVF, and uh, the one egg that we had was apparently very good quality because he's sitting in the bedroom right now, chilling. He's so and cute. He is. He is the sweetest thing ever. And I had a great pregnancy. I was unable to continue carnivore because, unfortunately, during my first trimester, I was very, very uh, unable to eat any meat. I couldn't smell it. I had all the meat aversions and I was very frustrated because I enjoyed being carnivore because when I did the three months carnivore, I saw even more of my symptoms either go completely away or improve significantly. But the more I ate carnivore, the more I didn't even really miss veggies as much as I thought that I would. So I wasn't able to go carnivore my entire pregnancy, but after I had the baby, I guess I was probably eight weeks postpartum and I started carnivore again um, for many reasons because I felt better when I ate carnivore. And also um, I wanted to see if I could shed that last 10 pounds, maybe weight, how fast I could do it, if it would affect my breastfeeding. Because there's a lot of people out there that think you can't eat low carb right. if you're breastfeeding. So they for sure think that you can't do carnivore if you're right. breastfeeding, which is just not true. And my milk supply has been fine. My baby is huge. He's a giant. He is in the 99th percentile for length. Yeah, he, he is the longest baby I've ever seen. He's happy. He's uh, growing well. Our pediatrician is very happy with his progress. Um, he's only had a few little cases of the sniffles. He's never run a temperature for the six months of his life. He's extremely healthy. I've been extremely healthy. And I am down to pre-pregnancy weight. Plus five more pounds. And I mean, that's, that's the dream, right? People wish right? they just have, have babies, breastfeed them, make a healthy, beautiful baby, and then get back to baby weight. Like, you know, what people yeah. pay for that. You can't buy that. No, no, you can't. And uh, I feel amazing too. And as a lot of people know, pregnancy tends to make uh, thyroid issues worse because hormones. Okay. Uh, and a lot of women, their Hashimoto's gets triggered by pregnancy. Okay. So the fact that my markers during my pregnancy were better than they ever were and continue to be better than they ever were, even after having a baby, uh, is a pretty big deal. And I also had a, a postpartum hair loss. And then I got back on the carnivore train, kind of crunched down. <laughs> Where it fell out, I was bald. And now it's growing back and it literally looks like I chopped it off with scissors. It's so thick. It just sticks straight up. It's hilarious to look at. It's ridiculous. But it came back. Like the minute I was like, tighten up, get back to the carnivore thing. It just, it stopped. It stopped falling out and it's coming in super gray because Rona. But uh, it's so much thicker than it was just a month and a half ago. And it, even a few videos that I did on Facebook Live, because obviously we do Facebook Lives every Monday. You know, a few people, if I wear my hair up, you could see my scalp and they were like, oh, you're losing hair because postpartum. Like it was noticeable. And yep. now you can't see it. It's so thick and dark. It looks like just my regular hairline I'm now. So right now, and I've seen a lot of videos of you lately. I know part of it is we're so hard on ourselves, right? Like, yeah, I'm yeah. yeah. But at the same time, right now, your hair looks very thick. It, it is. Good. That's awesome. Yeah. I some hair right after so I have three babes and after each one and I was carnivore through all of them I did still lose some hair and I think part of that is normal when you're losing weight in general 
<laughs> yeah. have, you know, gastric bypass, people who lose weight in most any fashion. They're yeah, exactly. Some hair in the process. And mm -hmm. I definitely did, but mine came back to, you know, I, I knew the first time I panicked a little bit, that's a lot of hair coming out. <laughs> Second time I was like, well, okay, it worked out. And by the third one, I was like, oh, look, my hair is falling out. <laughs> right, yeah. And I, I, I fully expect for most women, you're going to go through some hair loss at some point in your life, just hormonal changes, diet changes, weight changes, stress. There's all kinds of reasons your hair falls out. Yes. But if you're eating the right way, yes, it's going to eventually resolve itself. It's most likely temporary. Uh, some women don't eat enough protein, but I think that carnivore pretty much takes care of that problem. <laughs> if you're not getting any protein, you're not doing carnivore quite right. <laughs> no, definitely not. But even when I speak about carnivore on a live or anything like that, I always still get so many questions about can't, aren't you eating too much protein? Yeah. And it's crazy to me that carnivore has taken off. I mean, in the last year it's been huge and there's still this stigma attached to eating too much of something that it, we're literally made out of. Yes. Oh, you're, you are dead on with that one. I get questions every day about, is this too much protein? <laughs> yeah. What made you think that was going it, to, it, it's a meat diet, but you're going to have a lot of protein. You're not right. eating carbs, you're not eating sugar, you're not eating this, this. So you're going to have some protein. I just released one today with um, Amber O'Hearn and Dana Spencer. And love it's the her. three of us talking, I love them. Yeah. And it's the three of us talking about fat versus lean. Same thing everybody's talking about right now. Yeah. <laughs> I think that, that, Ugly word, gluconeogenesis, gets thrown around a lot by people who don't understand truly what gluconeogenesis is. Yeah. And so that gets stuck in people's head. And it's insane to me. But it's, I guess it's human nature to hear the negative over the positive. And people get really stuck on, I'm going to gain weight. It's going to all turn to, you know, my, blue, my blood glucose is going to go up. All that stuff. It's just... Instead of seeing what your body is, what's happening right. while you're eating it, you're, you're listening to other people who probably aren't even carnivore There's tell you, <laughs> tell you that gluconeogenesis is bad. Yes, that's true. So many voices yelling who haven't even actually tried this. Right. But, you know, give it up. Give it several months. Then tell me about your gluconeogenesis. How's it going? <laughs> right. And another thing is people will try carnivore. And they'll gain weight yeah. and they'll freak out and, but they're not measuring inches. No. They're just getting on that scale. And as you know, pretty much probably everybody who's listening to this podcast knows carnivore is one of the best things to change how your body is made yes. in a positive way. Yes. So I'm sure my bone density is much better than it used to be. Uh, my muscle is better than it used to be. And that can make the scale go up, but that doesn't mean that's a bad thing. That stupid scale. I wish that those were just obsolete. Yep. Absolutely. So Nisha, if there is a woman at home and she is not feeling awesome right now, okay? I don't know what all that would entail, but she's not feeling great. What symptoms should she be looking out for in order to make her think maybe this is possibly... Hashimoto's. The main thing for me that made me say, whoa, this is not a normal phase or stress or whatever was the fact that my personality changed so much. And a lot of the women that I talk to that have thyroid or Hashimoto's or any of the hormone issues say the same thing, that they stop being who they truly are and start being basically just a shadow of their former former self so being self-aware is something i think a lot of people aren't really good at it takes you really focusing and paying attention to what's happening in your own life to be able to kind of wake up out of this brain fog yeah. and say this is not normal and maybe something's going on here because i think in society right now it is considered normal to feel bad, to be tired, to be in pain, to just be, have brain fog. Those kind of things that are considered normal because so many people have them, but that doesn't mean that it is healthy. Right. Uh, normal is such a weird relative term. Like that's not a good word. I hate when people use that word because 
what is that quote? What's normal for the spider is chaos for the fly. Like it just depends. I like that. So I think every woman who feels like something is off needs women, you know, we got that gut. We all do. Mm -hmm. And we listen to it for everybody else. We listen to it for our kids, for our spouse. But for some reason, we don't listen to it for ourselves a lot of the time. So if you are having that gut feeling that something is off, that you something's not right with your body, you should definitely listen to it. And you find a doctor who will listen to you and will do all the labs that you want and will, without question. So the th- all the thyroid tests, not just TSH, your hormones, all of those things that Dr. Barry has a video, I'm sure, <laughs> on his YouTube channel about all the different labs. Okay. You go after the answer until you find the answer and go to all these Facebook groups, forums. That's what I had to do. I had to dig and find something that was on social media. Okay. Because what I was looking for in textbooks, I was in nursing school when this was happening and nothing in my textbook was saying feeling as bad as you're feeling isn't normal. Basically they were just teaching the same thing for the last, what, 20, 25 years. And even now doctors I hear every day, my doctor won't listen to me. My doctor says that my thyroid labs are normal and that I'm fine, but I'm not fine and he won't listen to me. It's very frustrating. So sometimes you just have to go after the truth on your own and change your health on your own. Find somebody who will prescribe desiccated thyroid. Um, Pharmacies usually will be able to tell you if there's a physician in your area that prescribes it, and then you can then go to that physician. Usually they're more open if they're prescribing desiccated thyroid. But most importantly, check yourself. What are you eating? Because honestly, that's the biggest thing that made the difference in the long run for me was what I was putting in my body. I know, isn't that shocking? (laughs) I can't believe that. (laughs) No, that's such good advice. All right, so... I think you are dead on when you say that as a society, we have just accepted that getting a little older means feeling a little crappier. Mm -hmm. And and today I was just in a Zoom meeting with a bunch of coworkers and almost every single person on there, they were talking about, just got off track, talking about naps. And they were all like, oh yeah, I have to have my nap. And I I for real just sat there and I didn't pipe up to be like the (laughs) little Debbie Dunn, like, oh, I never need a nap. But seriously, I don't feel like In our 40s, we should, unless you're up with the baby all night, right? (laughs) there are circumstances, of course, but I don't think it should just be a normal part of being over the hill that we have to take naps every day and have a cabinet full of medicines that we take every day, and that if we mow the yard, our back's going to hurt for days. I mean, that I feel like that should be reserved for maybe the octogenarians more than... (laughs) For sure, for sure. Uh, 50 is not old. No. And and there's so many people that follow Ken and I that will say consistently on our lives, I feel better at 50. I feel better at 60, 70 than I did when I was in my twenties. And that right there shows you that there is a problem with what we're eating and, you know, for the norm. Because if you feel better in your sixties and seventies than you did when you were in your twenties, uh-huh. Hello. That was the wrong fuel. That was the wrong fuel in exactly. your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, and congrats, you figured it out in your 60s, and you feel awesome. I hear right. that a lot, too. It is possible to age backwards. It is. Really. Okay, so if somebody is feeling like, I've got to have a nap every day, it's like I can't move. To me, the only thing I can relate that with is when I was very pregnant. I was so tired at times, and I think that's fair. When you are very pregnant, your body needs you to chill. Right. (laughs) And so there were times when I was so tired, it's like I couldn't really hold my eyes open. But there are plenty of women not pregnant who just feel that way. And if they are feeling that way, it would be a great idea for them to get a full uh, thyroid panel done, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. And to, I liked your idea about going and asking pharmacies. You said to ask the pharmacist, correct? Mm Who? Who in the community supports, say that what it is again, desiccated thyroid. So the difference between desiccated thyroid and something like levothyroxine, synthroid, those are both the same thing. It's just generic and brand name. Okay. So desiccated thyroid is a true form of the hormone, the thyroid hormone, where synthroid, levothyroxine, is fake. 
So okay. your body is obviously able to use something that's real and not synthetic. Okay. That makes sense. Usually. Uh, some people can't tell a difference, but I think that that's because either their dose is too low, their dose is too high, or they haven't give it, given it uh, enough time to you know, get in their body and start actively changing things. Because the thing with thyroid is, is you really do need to keep an eye on your labs almost every three months if you're starting out on a new medication because it, your dose needs to be titrated appropriately to how you're feeling and also what your lab levels show. So it's just like any other hormone. You got to keep a close eye on it because things change it. If you're changing from keto to carnivore, you may, guess what? Get to have a lower dosage like me. I'm on the very lowest dose. And honestly, I think I could probably get away with not taking it. But since I'm breastfeeding and all that stuff, like I just don't want to throw anything out of whack. But I know there are some people who've come Completely came off their thyroid medication. I think it's interesting that people with Hashimoto's have stopped medication because they felt so much better. It's a really big deal. Um, carnivore really, I feel like, is the hormone hacking diet or way of eating or whatever you want to call it because you're just, there's nothing processed. It's just meat. It's a one ingredient food. It's a cow. It's a chicken. It's a lobster, whatever. It's not hard to get those things. Well, it might be a little hard right now, but for the most part, it's not that hard to get it. It's very simple. You don't have to do lots of recipes. No. Stick it in a frying pan, throw some bacon grease on top of it, some salt and pepper if you want to. There you go. You're done. It's, t it's less time consuming. My refrigerator is basically empty. Yep. I don't ever throw anything out because nothing goes bad produce isn't in there. I don't right. have to look for the stinky thing and dig away with it. No more fruit flies. No more fruit flies. It's just, it's a simple, clean, effective way to heal. Amen, sister. Yep. I love that. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of folks like you where if it's a hard to diagnose thing and they are having some symptoms, but they don't have that official diagnosis, it's going to be hard for them to get the thyroid meds that, that you've mentioned. Um, but you say, stay with the testing and find a doctor who's going to be willing to do it. And in the meantime, in the meantime, do what you can control. Cause I get, I've got, um, a family member myself who was going through crazy symptoms. She's not getting a diagnosis that she she's not getting what she needs to get, the real medicine that could probably help. But in the meantime, she's doing everything she can control. So she's cutting out plants. She's cutting out, you know, for sure, gluten and grains and sugars, mm. all of these inflammatory things. And going as basic as you can go, which you just said beautifully, is meats. And just control what you can. Reach out to people and ask the questions that hopefully you have helped to inspire today, such as, are you familiar with Hashimoto's disease? These are my symptoms. You could even go home if you are having thoughts like, I really don't feel like myself. Talk to someone who's around you and say, you know, I don't really feel like myself. Have you noticed any changes? And it's okay, be honest. Is it just me? And they might be able to say, you know, I love you, but you do seem like something's just off. And that could be the confirmation to, and the motivation to go see someone or at least just clean out that fridge and eat some cow, right? For sure. Exactly. Having someone be your mirror yeah. throughout the entire journey, honestly, is just a really good tool because sometimes it's hard to see the small changes because, I mean, you're with yourself every day. But someone who loves you will be able to give you the actual honest feedback right. that you really need. So like Ken will uh, ask me, do you think that uh, you've, uh, I've been inflamed lately? Cause I had some cream this week yeah. and I'll be like, yes, <laughs> yes. Because uh, honestly, and, and dairy is considered carnivore by lots of people, yes. but uh, for us, it seems like dairy is becoming a problem. Oh, yes. It is at our house as well. In fact, the running joke is if anything goes wrong at our house and it's become such a joke that even if like the starter on the van won't work, we know it was the dairy. 
<laughs> yeah. And, and I think that that's a common thing among people who have just started eating more simply and cutting things out. Just like when I first started eating keto at the beginning, I ate tons of nuts. And then when I cut out nuts, it was like, wow, those were really affecting me. And I had no idea. Same with all the veggies. Same with now dairy. And the one thing that I haven't had to cut out, oddly enough, is a uh, beef. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I know. Beef doesn't seem to cause me any problems, brings me lots of joy, tastes delicious, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good well, thing. Beef. I've never had a single person email me and be like, man, it just seems like the more beef, more problems. Nope. No, <laughs> no, no, not an issue. But dairy for sure yes. uh, has become one of those things that we've been talking about phasing out more and more because it's just – now that we know and we're paying attention to how we feel, it's like, yeah, the days that we add dairy in, it seems like we don't feel as good or I, I don't, I don't feel as awake or I don't sleep as good or I have more aches and pains, anything like that. What's crazy is that your body is so in tune now and to the, you're to the point where you can know that that one thing is what's bothering you. Yep. And you're paying attention to it. Whereas, you know, when we were eating the standard American diet, it was just like, oh, it's another day, another ache, another pain, another need for a nap. I never once was like, hmm, I wonder what made me feel that way. I just thought, hey, here I am. I'm 30 and this is 30. But no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. I do. I feel like standard American diet, you're just like going through the world feeling like junk. You have no idea why. You're just in the, in the dark about it. Yeah. And yes, now you do sort of become like a very fine-tuned machine. You know, like I drive around my, old, my minivan. My husband will say, you know, the transmission was slipping. I was like, oh, is it? You know, I don't, I'm not fine-tuned with that van. Right. But somebody who has a really sweet Corvette, let's say, they've rebuilt it. Any little thing, they're so in tune with it. And so if they put any gasoline in it that's not like the perfect fuel i'm trying to sound like i know about cars i have no idea what i'm talking about but if they use a less than top notch fuel for their car they can feel it there's a little rattle a little this a little that i could probably pour pure garbage in my van i'd be like i don't know it's okay right i guess that's right. how many vans feel <laughs> right and that's such a great analogy because we aren't the goal should be that we are paying that close attention to our health and our bodies because we only get one of these there is no backup plan. This is it. This is all you got. And, and some damage can't be undone, but a lot of it can. A lot of it can. And so I think a lot of people think that they've done so much damage, like why change now? But that is just not true. You can. You can do better. You will feel better. Some things you cannot get all the way back, but you will be better than you were for sure and add years to your life and quality to those years because that's really the goal here is quality of life. It's not just to live to a hundred years old because who wants to live to a hundred? If you can't get up, you can't do for yourself. You don't know your family. Like no one wants that. But if you're a hundred years old and you are still kicking it like Ken's granny Barry, she's 90. And that woman, she can get up and do her own thing. She lives on her own. She's with us right now, but she can do everything for herself. And that's what I'm looking for. Yes. Nisha, I hope you keep telling your story to anyone and everyone that will listen because I know it is changing lives. Please keep singing. I love your voice so much. Please keep bringing the cute outfits because I look at you <laughs> and she's cute. Your freckles, my kids have heard me say them like, look at her cute freckles. I love your freckles so much. <laughs> <laughs> what a random thing to pick up on. No, I get told that a lot. I think freckles are making a comeback, which is really funny because I got made fun of, you know, in middle school and now people are getting them tattooed on their face. It's crazy, but yeah, yeah thank you. I think they want to go buy some freckles. That's what the truth is. <laughs> Nisha, thank you for telling your story and for being just the fun, delightful human that you are. And I'll let you go get back to that sweet baby. Thank, thank you, you so much. much, Kelly, for having me on and letting me tell my story and hopefully reach a few people that haven't heard it yet. I hope so. Thank you. Bye, Nisha. Bye.